Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what Mama don't allow, gonna draw my modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio. Join host George Smart and Frank King as they talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. Show your support by reviewing us at iTunes and visiting U.S. Modernist massive archives at usmodernist.org or on Instagram at mr.modernism. Today, U.S. Modernist Radio welcomes the femme fatale of Home Builders Associations nationwide, <laughs> blogger Kate Wagner of McMansion Hell. And now, just back from Richard Neutra's 125th birthday party, George Smart and Frank King. Yes, it was quite a party. Neutra wasn't there, of course. He died in 1970. I thought but, so. <laughs> but Frank and I celebrated by arguing about Rudolf Schindler. Tush. Then making up while we were both in the hospital in the same room, as fate would have it. That's a true story. Not for us, but for Neutra and Schindler. Oh. We'll have to tell that story sometime. I'm George Smart. And I'm Frank King. Support for U.S. Modernist Radio comes from, you know who, Sarah Sonk of Bod Holmes Realty. Bless her heart. Oh my, she is a wonderful, intelligent, lovely single lady who is into John Legend, Brewer chairs, <laughs> dancing with the stars, and pomegranate martinis. No, wait a minute. What? Oh, I'm sorry. That's her Match.com profile. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't tell my wife I had that pulled up. Sarah Song is a real estate agent who gets modern like you do. She's totally into it and has the expertise, experience, and track record to close your deal. Go to ModHomesRealty.com or give her a holler. 919-601-7339. And by our newest sponsor, Quality Fabricators of Benson. You don't need no stinking architects when Quality Fabricators Fabricators of Benson can build you one of them modernistic homes. I'm not sure why anybody would want one when you can buy a nice double for half the, half the money for half the cost of professionals with actual experience. I mean, how hard can it be? There's nothing that their man Gene can't do with two by fours from the Home Depot or fix with a little Sears caulking spackle or some packing peanuts. Call his boss, Earl. <laughs> oh, at least he thinks he's boss. I believe his old lady is actually the boss. At 919-355-8837. Best to call him in the morning before he goes home for um, um, lunch. This week only, 20% off cantilevers and a free six pack of red, white, and blue. <laughs> Today, U.S. Modernist welcomes Kate Wagner, creator of the riotously popular blog McMansionHell.com. I like her already. Where she tears into the impractically large, ridiculously constructed, and often hilariously furnished monuments to wealth misspent. As a writer for Curbed and others, she's appeared on 99% Invisible and has her own TEDx talk. Like us, she's a fan of modernist evil lairs, writing about buildings used in films to depict evil corporation archetypes in Robocop, Blade Runner, and The Matrix. She's got a huge following and a new book in the works. Oh, yeah. Well, who doesn't? <laughs> <laughs> Me. All right. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. McMansion came about when? When did the word come into common use? The you know? word, it came in in around the 90s. Um, I can't remember exactly who was responsible with creating the term, but it entered the lexicon pretty quickly. Um, but it started appearing, I mean, in my primary sources, I, I started around like 1991. Um, though the phenomenon of the McMansion, of course, started like about a decade earlier. So, I noticed on your website that the logo for McMansion Hell is Ronald Reagan. Is that a... <laughs> A sign of the 80s of McMansionism? <laughs> um, it's kind of started out as a joke just because uh, Reagan was the one who put in Alan Greenspan in the Fed. And Alan Greenspan led to a lot of financial muckery that was very much a part of the financial crisis, which McMansions are sort of the symbolism of a burst housing bubble 
though uh, they didn't cause a housing bubble and they didn't cause a recession, but they are just sort of the symbolism of that. But also, I just kind of like kept it in there uh, because his face is hilarious in that picture. He's just yes. like, I love this. This is amazing. Even though Reagan himself lived in a very beautiful modernist house, which has now been destroyed and replaced with like a horrible, like oh. $20 million L.A. or California celebrity house or whatever a trophy it's just, house it's a trophy house now I and mean, it was just a really nice house when he lived in there and he had a, it had a great kitchen and it was beautiful you can you can look it up online if you want to feel sad um but the <laughs> i kept i actually commissioned someone to design a logo and they did design one for me and i ended up just keeping reagan because it kind of ticked my dad off so <laughs> that's my personal reason uh but also, I just think that that picture is hilarious and really encapsulates sort of the tone of of the blog. It could it, it doesn't it didn't even have to be Reagan. Just anyone with the same face probably would have worked. Well, let's go back to uh, somebody tore it down. I mean, I didn't think they tore down anything Ronald Reagan ever lived in. Uh, I think that it was not technically a tear down. I think it was technically they just built so much on top of it that you can't see what was originally there. Oh, okay. It was one uh, of those of unfortunate, yeah, uh, unfortunate renovations. Yeah. As McMansions came into our consciousness in the 90s, they were associated with some sort of luxurious living. H- has it lived up to that promise? I mean, the McMansion is sort of all about the image of luxury rather than luxury itself. Uh, anyone who's sort of been a Mc, in a McMansion gets the the sort of symbolism of luxury. They walk in and there's like these huge spaces. There's a bunch of opulent detailing that's actually just mass produced, which is interesting. The authenticity of actual wealth is not there. Uh, they're all made extremely cheaply. Uh, the from everything from the architectural detailings on the outside, which are usually made out of out of a type of, of foam or uh, injectable <laughs> foam? cement. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what the Romans used, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, d- wasn't Bernini? Wasn't he like a a, a foam? Like, have you seen those amazing sculptures of him of the of like the people touching that are all in the internet all the time? Those were made out of foam, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He was a he was a master, uh, <laughs> but yeah, the. It's the image so the of the details wealth. are cheap. It's all cheap. If you look close enough, like the ceilings don't match right at the right angles and the and the stairs and the materials are just bad. Like the, the wood cabinets are MDF that are painted to look like wood. It just the list goes on and on. It's it's just about imagery and not about actual wealth because I'm pretty sure people with actual wealth put a little bit more effort into their houses than just like I want it big and I want these things on it that say that I'm rich and that's it. And they don't care how they just want the image. They don't want the the sort of the quality that comes. With. I mean, you look at the the grand houses of the 19th century, the houses by uh, that were commissioned by you know the Vanderbilts and the robber barons of the day, and they did not it, they did not look like this. Uh, they took a, an extreme amount of pride back in the day in the material quality of the construction. This is why so many are made in, with stone that's so heavy because the the use of such stone implies a lot of labor behind it and uh, implies a lot of difficulty in in moving, transporting, and and utilizing that stone. Uh, whereas McMansions, it's it's all just veneers. It's like the bricks. There's the no wall is made out of brick. It's made out of every. It's made out of like tracked house wall, and then. They put a brick on top of it. So if you were to drive a car into a McMansion, it would go right through. It would it would do some a serious damage. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it would do a lot more damage than, than it would to like a brick house. Yeah. Let's establish then what a mansion is. Whenever I think of mansion, I think of that granite house that the Beverly Hillbillies were in. No. It had, had the cement pond in the back and it was very stately and... You could tell that it was built solid. I think that uh, a mansion is, of course, like a very large house. But the difference between a mansion and a McMansion is is quality of design and quality of materials and quality of execution. Design, of course, being following any sort of architectural etiquette, whether it's traditional or classic or like 
like classicism versus modernism versus whatever, it still executes things in a way that is architecturally pleasing and makes sense. Uh, and it's executed with materials that are of the highest quality that were meant to that last a hundred years instead of 15. Uh, and it, and of course, like the integration with the site and the surrounding area, everything is done meticulously. I mean, if you think about the most famous mansion ever, which is Biltmore in my home state of North Carolina oh. and yours, Yay. Mm-hmm. uh, you see that everything is of the utmost quality to the point where you're just oversaturated. Well, you walk in and the chandelier is just so massive and huge and the stone staircases and it's pretty amazing. Just you the can just fireplaces. Tell God, the you fireplaces. Can, they're huge. They're huge. Doesn't a real mansion sit on some property? Yeah. Usually. With a capital P? Yeah. Though I think that um that's not necessarily a, a determining factor because some people spend all their money on the land and not that much money on the house, and so you get McMansions. Some people spend no money on the on the land and spend all the money on the house and get McMansions. Mm. Uh, that's like sort of exurban paradigm. Uh, build all the way out in exurbia, and the, where the land is so much less expensive than it is closer to the city center. Uh, there's nothing around you. You can just build as big as you want. But most people who do this aren't exactly the wealthiest people. They're usually like middle class or upper middle class. And so they build what they can afford, which is they sacrifice the sort of build quality for, for size. And, and rather than build a small house with an architect or with someone who is more classic in their design, then they build instead sort of the design dream home plans.com plans and right hey hey just because it's cheap i mean and i think that's an like kind of an american thing is just order your plans on you get to have the appearance of shopping rather than people <sighs> don't want to see their locus of control to somebody else that's why american most americans are like i don't want to hire an architect i want to design my house but i think that's interesting but the land thing is is interesting yeah Kate, how do we recognize a McMansion? I mean, what are some of the telltale signs? For our listeners who are not well-versed in in architecture and all the isms through the years, just how do you spot one? Uh, I think it's kind of like obscenity. You know it when you see it. Um, (laughs) But to to codify and to taxonomize has sort of been my modus and my research beyond just like making the funny posts. it's been to sort of understand and, and develop a sort of dictionary of McMansions and and whether or not there are regional differences or et cetera, et cetera. But usually what you, the first thing that I notice about a McMansion is the roof line, which is usually just a jumbled mess and can be taller than the actual house. Um, there's things like protrusions, multiple pitches of roof, uh, just the, the sheer mass of, of the roof form compared to to the actual massing of the house is usually uh, either like a third of the total mass or or more than half. All What's the way. that all about? I mean, why do that? Uh, because mommy wants cathedral ceilings in her master bathroom upstairs. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, honestly, it's because they're designed from the inside out and the people who build them cut corners. And so you have a bunch of like irregularities on the interiors, especially on the second floors. Where just they just do what is easiest and cheapest, which sometimes does not involve sort of any sort of reinforcement of, of core roof structure. So they're sort of just building it out instead of like planning it and, and orchestrating the inside to work with the outside. They're just like, we're just going to build the inside and the outside be damned. Uh, so like, really the second, like the second floor is just a bunch of mismatched pieces that then it, you find a roof to put on top of? Pretty much. That's what I've noticed, at least. Some some are worse than others, but they do uh, they take the path of least resistance with roof building. Is is the the long and short of it? The front exteriors usually there's first of all the thing I notice is like a huge garage and it makes no attempt to conceal itself. <laughs> um, second thing I notice is usually that there's a, a two story entryway, though not always, but almost. I would say that seventy percent of McMansions have a two story entryway. Now that's the missile silo entryway, right? 
Yeah, or I call it the lawyer foyer. Um, <laughs> you'll have a door, and it's a big door, but then you'll have a transom window above the door that's at least the size of the door. Uh, and it tends to be square on the sides and arched on the top and with just a really, really boring grid of like nine by nine vinyl muttons. It's the square window with the arch top has been in architecture since the beginning of architecture, but it's not squat and fat and divided into cubes until like 1980. But anyway, so that's where your chandelier comes down and you can see it through the transom window and you walk in and it's like, oh, look at all this huge space that I have to heat and cool that does nothing. Um, (laughs) What is the purpose of that giant foyer anyway? Uh, to make it look like you're rich. That's the purpose. Okay. Yeah, That's before, just, you get too far, before you get too far into the house and find out that the rest of it's falling apart. Yeah. Though I don't think it's the intention for it to fall apart. I think that it's just, oops. Um, the And the exterior, again, is, is just kind of, there's just masses sort of attached to things. Like there's some, there's some tropes, like the dining room is in a one-story mass that has like a turreted top. And it's attached to, like, one side of the house. Usually there's at least one major mass attached to one side of the house. And the other side is attached is the garage. Uh, And also there's just inconsistencies in design. You'll see houses with different shapes of windows. So you'll see houses with rectangular windows, square windows, circle windows. No triangle windows because they're not that cool. Um, (laughs) And you'll see within those windows different um, window mutton stylings. So you'll see some with like the prairie muttons, which is just a farce. Like it's like this is not a prairie style house. This is a this is not even attempting to look like a prairie style house. I'm sorry. What is a mutton? Oh, it's the pieces of wood or vinyl in between that separate the panes of glass from each other in a window. Oh, thanks. It's okay. And then the the what separates within one uh, whole window, what sep- what divides the windows is the mullion is the. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's the word I've heard of. Uh, but it's it's just, that's just like so, architecture speak. But, uh, a, but a prairie mutton is... That's the, the ones where you, uh, where it looks like the wood or vinyl comes in from the edge of the of the window, leaving the main part of the window empty. And then it, it the four corners are smaller squares. Um, oh. That's, it's like, it's inspired by like Frank Lloyd Wright's windows and... It's uh, you've you've probably seen it on some like fake craftsman houses. I have. Yep. Yeah. I know what you're talking about. They're also just really bad because people put them on houses that pay no homage to any of those styles, uh, and it makes me angry. Tom is brown nosing the teacher again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should be angry. Go, go. You go, girl. <laughs> Kate, what about? I've seen on. Very expensive houses, all kinds of material I would expect to see like on mobile homes, like <laughs> sprayed stucco and oh, yeah. vinyl even. Oh, vinyl. Well, vinyl's out and and hardy board is in. Hardy board, okay. Uh, or hardy plank, which is the, the sort of like new vinyl. That's what on all the new houses have is the, that, that's their, that's their fake wood siding of, of today. Apparently there's huge, there's huge issues with bugs, but I do have to agree it looks better than vinyl, which looks awful, um, and has always looked awful. But the stucco paneling, the stucco boards, and the sprayed-on stucco drives me insane. Why? Because stuccoing is an art and a, and a very sort of respected trade that's sort of dying out, and we just replace it with this cheap crap that looks bad and ages p- extremely poorly. Uh, Fake stucco also has just been notorious. This is the EFIS, the, the exterior insulating finishing system. The stucco EFIS. board. That sounds yeah. like an evil villain somewhere. It's just cheap stucco board, which is the, the bane of my existence, but probably not many others. Um, well, there's been a lot of class action lawsuits yeah, involving that's, that's stucco. What I was say. Yeah. 
doesn't work too well, especially in, you see it the most in areas like Florida, which have like the most humidity and would be the most prone to water damage. But I mean, that's just my two cents. And stucco in a humid environment, does it disintegrate or mildew or what happens to it? A lot of stucco becomes discolored because of automobile fumes. Mostly it's the way that this, the finishing system is affixed to the wall that causes the most water damage. Uh, things like it's not properly sealed was a huge lawsuit at one point. I think that was the 90s. And it, they got, it got better, but it's just it, it gets discolored through age. Uh, it doesn't stay all nice and clean. Uh, it's like vinyl siding too. You'll see like mil- mildew and stuff like that, moss, whatever. Would that be a characteristic of real stucco as well, or is this more real a Real stucco is more prone to cracking than it is to, uh, or flaking than it is to water damage. I mean, there are places built from real stucco that have lasted since the beginning of forever ago. I mean... That long. Classic, well, classic, <laughs> classic architecture in Europe from like the 1400s, and et cetera. I mean, stucco has been around for a very, very, very right. long time. So if you maintain it, it'll last forever. Oh, yeah. A long time. But fake stucco is put on by people who don't know how to maintain it. Yeah. I think that just ignorance is a huge part of it. Um, people do what they can afford and don't really look to, to any sort of design influence outside of popular culture and because of that things can get a little hairy i think that uh, most people i mean in america we don't really get an architecture education um i don't think in any of my classes except for maybe the the elective art class i took my junior year of high school we talked about architecture at all okay with all this being said these mcmansions are extremely popular and people are falling all over themselves not just to buy new ones but to buy resales why is this it's a cultural thing a lot of people think that the the summation of sort of the the great american dream is to have a big house and the bigger the house you have the more successful you are the fallacy there is is no one cares about a big cheap house Uh, and that's why the mick term is so applied to mansion. I mean, they're Mick mansions because there are just so many of them and none of them are special. I mean, some of them are really special in that they're particularly horrible, but <laughs> they're not they're not special within architecture at all and not even to each other. I mean, they are all just like theme and variations of the same thing. Sometimes you dress them up in different architectural styles, but they're all the same thing underneath. And the popularity of, of resales depends on the age of the resale because a lot of these houses weren't really built to last like even 15 years. And so you're starting to see horrible roof damage and the roofs are so extensive that to redo the roof, you might as well just buy a new house. Um, you can tell those right by the multiple gables and planes on a house. I've seen some of these houses have as many as 20 or 30 roof sections. Oh, yeah. Easily. Yeah. On your blog, Kate, you are amazingly hilarious when you take a McMansion and you actually dissect it to point out the pieces of the McMansion that are badly done or just ridiculous. One of my favorites, you were showing the inside of one, and I guess this was the office or the den, and you pointed out a table that said, this is the manly table, only cigars can live here. (laughs) Tell us about how you dissect these houses on your blog. Um, well, I, I focus a lot on cultural tropes and, and sort of American culture. And so to just pinpoint exactly what the sort of Im- underlying image of things is, like the, the big desk in the, in the office with all the bookshelves and the dark colored walls is, is a trope of sort of male power. That's, mm-hmm. that's been the sort of male office trope since the beginning of time. And even though women can work in offices – they probably won't decorate them the same because women have better taste. The, yeah, sure. We know that. <laughs> most of them. But, I mean, <laughs> most of them. But Takata, it's, so it just, it's exposing those desires that are, are fragile. Um, so to, the, the desire to look important and stately in your office is a fragile desire, um, especially if you don't get any work done. 
And I think that a lot of people use symbolism, especially in architecture, to sort of conceal the weaknesses in their lives. To use the symbolism of, of the huge house built with cheap materials is just a, is a farce. It's, it's like, yeah, we have enough to build it big, but not build it right. Is It's like we actually weren't rich enough, and we are just trying to compensate for that. It's just the compensation for wealth that people don't have or like to think that they have. It's exposing the vulnerability of American culture. So like making fun of the huge television dominating the room or making fun of how many different bedrooms they are and the fact that like people can go 10 days without talking to each other in the, in the same house or whatever. It's, 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 a, it's a commentary on how Americans interact with their homes and how they use symbolism and and architectural tropes interior tropes etc to convey certain images that are just not true and exposing the that farce is sort of what people find funny um do you think that people who live in these mcmansions are happy in their home i think that comes down to whether or not the family is happy i make a lot of divorce jokes for a reason yeah um when i was growing up my Girl Scout troop leader had a McMansion and we had Girl Scouts in there and she was divorced. And there was just, there were just symbols of, of loneliness that were just scattered throughout the house and outside, like in the backyard, they were painting, repainting the fence. And then there's a part where the fence is, is stops being painted. And you know, that's when everything sort of fell apart. Um, And you'll see things like, like the walls aren't painted any color. They're just all white. And the furniture is just sort of plopped in there. There's so much empty space that they didn't know what to do with or like someone took the other furniture. All the rooms are so separate from each other that this is in like 2006. The children would have to like text their parents because they were so far away in the house physically. (laughs) I mean, it's just – it's an environment that fosters loneliness. Some people equate privacy and happiness, but the the, sort of the truth is is if if you can hide – from your family, it doesn't make for a very well-adjusted life. It, yeah. just part of the reason why small houses are so successful, including my parents' house, was that we had to interact with each other in ways that sometimes were infuriating. Like I couldn't stand when my dad would decide to watch Saving Private Ryan with the 5.1 surround system and the subwoofer would go through the floor and, <laughs> you know, God. or my There's sister. a happy movie. <laughs> yeah. And we weren't allowed to watch it. We just had to suffer through the the Ugh. the constant like booming of this the subwoofer, and then my or my sister watching Bridezilla's or whatever she like loves trash TV, or like you know the pots and pans in the kitchen. There's just the sound is the way that it travels is so different, and and the fact that it's like the only privacy you have is your own room, um, and even then like so you have to be a family. Yeah, you kind of are forced to deal with each other's crap. And I think that if I didn't have to deal with that, I would most certainly not be as well adjusted as I am. And I'm realistically, I'm not that well adjusted, but I am more well adjusted than other people. Well, speaking Uh, of other people, how has the public reacted to your blog? Because I've seen just immense press about it and very positive response. Yeah, it got weirdly huge really quickly. Um, I started it in July. Uh, last like year, the last, right? the last week of July, yeah, last year. And then by September, I had interviews in like Paper Magazine and Business Insider, and it was just bizarre. And now I'm working on a book proposal, and it's just crazy. It, it pretty much pays my bills. I quit my job as an engineer to write full-time, which is a really weird thing that you never hear people say. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. In fact, I don't get any hate mail, really, which is really astonishing. Uh, because I think that like a lot of people just like hate these things. Either they grew up in them, grew up around them, or they just hate them. Um, Is there any organized governmental or community movement to try and control these things? These McMansions? there has been in in on the West Coast, especially. Uh, in I know in Portland they have sort of anti mansionization policies, and I think in LA they tried. This was like a, in 2015, I think, to to stop teardowns and McMansion building. I don't know how successful those are, but it does seem that a teardown and a McMansion tend to go hand in hand. 
Yeah, is that's that, the worst part. Yeah, is what you lost. Yeah. And Kate, I've, I've heard out in California just recently that they're now doing McMansions of modernist design where they're doing <laughs> these, these spectacularly architect design houses, but they're just so massive as to be ridiculous. Have you seen these? Oh, yeah. That's like so much of what is is in sort of realtor news or whatever. It's like Architectural Digest, too, is all about that. But the what's interesting is like I can't remember his name, but there's one guy who's just really infamous for this. Uh, he like designed like these huge bajillion dollar mansions in California and whatnot. But the modernist McMansion is a is has been a thing since around like 2007. Uh, not so much on the East Coast because modernism in the East Coast have a very different relationship than modernism in other parts of the country. The houses that are sort of the what I call the McModerns really are in in Texas and Central Southwest all the way through to the to the west coast of course in california but especially in washington washington state yes um it's it's really interesting they're just really badly done builder built modern houses they're they they don't they think that modernism is like when you put a turtle in in a box and you poke holes in the box for the turtle to get air it's just like a box with holes in it (laughs) it's horrible (laughs) I know some builders in this area that kind of think like that. It drives me insane. I'm like, can you read a book? <laughs> like, if you're going to do, if you're going to do modern architecture, I mean, that is the mo- probably the most documented period of architecture ever. There are standards and there are design. There's design language to that. That's and architects today, for the most part, still go to school to learn how to build modernist architecture. I just like hate the the idea that builders get into. I know that's elitist of me to say, but at the same time, like why can't these people just read a book about what something is supposed to look like or about the history of it before they decide to just like do their crappy like C minus version of it? I don't have no problems with builders building modern. I have problems with builders building bad modern. I would assume, Kate, that the TV shows like HGTV would be in- encouraging people to build small and appropriate. Is that happening? It's actually happening a lot more than it used to. I mean, if you look at things like Fixer Upper, which everyone tells me to like roast or whatever, what I won't roast it because all it is is taking houses in, in smaller and not quite glamorous communities in Texas and making them sort of more charming and bringing them sort of up to date in a way that's at least tasteful for the it's 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 a very regional style uh that they work in uh, both interiors and exteriors it's it's a very regional sort of local thing and i think that that's a step in the right direction for hgtv which focuses almost entirely on interiors now for the most part like the days of curb appeal and like homes on homes is is kind of over uh, House Hunters is probably on the only, and I love that show, admittedly, because I just love seeing inside of houses and seeing like, oh, yeah, I want to buy this house. And it's like, I know they already bought the house and this is all staged and fake, but I still like to watch it because I love houses. If I didn't love houses, I wouldn't be doing this. The H- HGTV has just been almost entirely interiors driven. They don't talk about architecture at all, which is kind of strange, honestly. I think that they could make a lot of money talking about architecture. Uh, or or doing more sort of archi- or follow they don't even follow architects or anything like that. It's it's just about buying homes, selling homes, and decorating homes. Not so much about building homes. The justification for McMansions, uh, according to what I've been able to determine, has always been that you you can't lose that if you buy a McMansion, it's going to hold its value. It's going to make you money in the future when you have to move to your next job. Has that held up? If you can sell it, I mean, if that's not as true as it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that's just not the truth anymore. That's the, and that, that's the truth for all housing, not just McMansions. Even though the market has healed since the recession, certain houses have a much more difficult time reselling because people, because as a new generation enters into, into the home buying sector, they want different things than the previous generation. Um, A lot of the McMansions were constructed by boomers, and younger people want to live closer to the city. They don't want to have to be entirely dependent on the car, because cars are stupid expensive. 
they want different things and their idea of a, of a status symbol is not necessarily the big house but to sort of have a meaningful life <laughs> And they could see that with like the tiny house thing and, and this the trend towards smaller. But the truth is, is that has been a trend because it's a generation that's saddled with debt and doesn't have that many sort of social help like the like the boomers have. I mean, we I mean, I'll never see Social Security a day in my life. Like I'm 23. It's just yeah, good that, luck that with system that. is it's yeah. just not there for us. I right. mean, it's totally been plundered. The. The so, so a lot is, of these folks grew up in in McMansions. Yeah, and, and I uh, think that they understand too. That I get a lot of emails that it's like I grew up in a house like this, and it was like a lonely, soul sucking existence because it took fifteen minutes in a car to see my friends. <laughs> fifteen minutes in a car to go get breakfast. Yeah, from the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, it's like oh, we need a gallon of milk. It's like thirty minutes. <laughs> Kate, you did a blog recently exploring some of the buildings used in movies to depict the evil corporation archetype, like in Robocop and Blade Runner. Tell us a little bit about what you found out. Um, it's interesting. I'm actually not a huge movie buff, but my sister is, and so she helped me with that, that article. But I do love dystopian movies especially. Uh, but what's interesting is they usually just appropriate the language or the actual buildings in the case of Robocop – that were from, you know, the period of late modernism, which is, I guess, 1960 through 1970, I'm going to say 73 to 77, um, depending on the area. Okay. Um, and the sort of, they took a lot of the, of the design language from like brutalist architecture, which is, of course, a favorite of mine. Um, Yay, concrete. Also, Yay, concrete. Yay, concrete. <laughs> I love concrete. And they also took sort of some language from like high tech, like the Pompidou Center uh, by Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano in Paris, which is one of my favorite buildings of all time. And they also took sort of the, the conceptual ideas of a lot of Japanese thinkers in the 70s, like the, the 60s and 70s, uh, the Metabolist School, which was sort of building these huge mega structures that, in, that were entire cities sort of encompassed within modules almost huge structures built of smaller pieces. What's even more interesting is the appropriation of corporate architecture from the, the 70s, including buildings by Philip Johnson and uh, the, that famous uh, Marriott with the four cil glass cylinders and the... That sounds like a Marriott. Yeah. Atlanta, I think. I think it's the one either in Atlanta or Detroit. There's, there's one in LA and then the one in Atlanta is really famous too. Yes. For being like a... They've shot a lot of movies in there. The Towering uh, Inferno, maybe, was... Yeah. You know, the Marriott Marquis. I think I've been in the elevators and the one in Atlanta. It's like... Yeah, they're interesting. They have Giant the weirdest, glass tubes. Weirdest uh, architecture. But that they, that was taken for, like, evil corporation at the time. Uh, I think in the article I cited also um, buildings by, like, Kevin Roche and... The Pyramids, yes. In, yeah, uh, the Pyramids. Indiana. Yeah, those are interesting. I mean, that period of architecture is so interesting to me because it's just they took the ideas of modernism to the sort of extremes to the point where something had to disrupt it because there's there's no way to, for them to further expand on the ideas. And so postmodernism happened that called them out. It's like this is ornament and you're wrong. Como. Um, yes. I, I mean, I love postmodernism, early postmodernism. I would like to clarify the postmodernism from the seventies. So like James Sterling, Stuttgart Center and the Van Aventuri house I love. I mean, all of that is is great. I mean, reading learning from Las Vegas in high school was what really got me into that stuff. Also it's like one of the first architectural treatises I attempted to read and could actually finish. Now I've read a lot of them and it's still the case. <laughs> uh, well the fact that you actually read that book by Venturi in high school is something to be said right there because not many people get to do that. Uh, actually, I went to the the community college library where I grew up, and they had they kind of stopped buying architecture books after about like nineteen ninety or whatever. So there's a lot of stuff from that era in there, and that's and that's sort of when I was really started to really get into architecture in high school. 
that was the stuff that I, I read. So like lots of huge anthologies by that were compiled by Charles Jenks, who is a famous postmodern theorist. And a lot of my view of architectural theory came from that period. And it was only afterwards that I began to study stuff retroactively. And you know, now, of course, going all the way back to Vitruvius and and explaining it for other people on the blog. Uh, so they don't have to suffer. <laughs> but I mean, I love that stuff, though. I'm like an academic at heart. And so it's really important to me. But also, I, I, I always, I'm always campaigning for, for the preservation of, of late modern and early postmodern architecture, even later postmodernism, especially interiors. Very excited that uh, number one poultry just got listed in Britain. But I was, that's James Sterling. That's not, I think 1990 or 1991. It usurped uh, Lloyd's building in England, which was Richard Rogers, yes. which is also amazing. Uh, I think high tech is some of the most dynamic and visually interesting architecture to come out of the 20th century. Whether or not it was an actual success as a building, uh, I mean, there's been always been problems with it because they actually put the structure, the interior structures on the outside, and that's going to leave them exposed to the elements and I was like, I understand the aesthetic choice, but practically there are issues. Kate, I, I want to thank you for a couple of things, for being on the show today. You've been a great guest. We'd love to have you back in the future. And also for supporting our website from way early on, back when you were oh, in high yeah. school. Yeah, back when it was still the Triangle Modernist Houses. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah was, that, that was That is old school. It was good times. Yeah, I, I think some of those pictures are mine that I sent, at least where I grew up. The, there's one house. I know that one of those is my pictures taken with my really bad cell phone. Well, um, let us know. We'll give you photo credit. Well, Kate, thanks again for being on the show. You can listen to Kate on several podcasts, including 99% Invisible. Her website and blog is mcmansionhell.com, and she writes for 99pi.org, Curbed, Curbly and sometimes Atlas Obscura, and she's also spending her free time as a grad student in Johns Hopkins and the Peabody in Baltimore, Maryland, studying acoustics. So thanks again, Kate. Thank you. As always, thanks for listening. Learn more about Kate Wagner at McMansionHell.com. If you'd like to travel to Palm Springs, and hey, who wouldn't, and hang out with the cool kids next February during Modernism Week, send an email to george at ncmodernist.org. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Sarah Salk, the beautiful, regal, saintly real estate agent. God, what's this brown nose party of one who loves, modern, who loves modernist houses just as much as you do. 919-601-7339. And by the fine gentleman, have you met these guys? At Quality Fabricators of Benson. Okay, take us out, Tom. Visit usmodernist.org for links about people and buildings mentioned today. U.S. Modernist Radio is edited by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song was performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of North Carolina Modernist Houses, a nonprofit educational resource for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. If you like the show, write a great review on iTunes. George and Frank and I will be back in two weeks for another vinyl-sided, gable roof, fully stuccoed, <laughs> 10,000 square foot, randomly furnished McShow on U.S. Modernist Radio. All right. <laughs> <laughs>